Bull Dominion is back. We apologize for the hiatus. We've been hard at work on a lot of cool audio projects that you can check out at virginiaaudio.org. But we are so excited to bring you more stories about our changing Commonwealth of Virginia. I'm Mary Garner McGee, and I'm the managing producer for the Virginia Audio Collective at WTJU. For us Virginians, every year is an election year. But this is a big election year, and we know that right now you're up to your ears in news about the campaigns and polling numbers and the real gravity of this national election. We've had a couple dark and stressful weeks of news. And so here on Bold Dominion, we're not going to talk that much about the presidential election. We know it's a very important election, but we think that we all deserve to also hear more about how policies and politics are actually impacting our day-to-day lives right now. We want you to walk away from each episode of Bold Dominion with information that you're excited to share with your friends and that helps you make more informed decisions about things in your life. So right now we're working on episodes about the minimum wage and recycling, our school systems and our roadways. And if you have something that you'd like to learn more about, please get in touch Our email is wtjupodcasts at virginia.edu. Okay, it feels great to be back. Let's start the show. You're listening to Bold Dominion, a state news explainer for a changing Virginia. Today, we're going to kick off this new season with an interview about... Food assistance. Look, Food is just more expensive than it was a few years ago, before the COVID-19 pandemic. And the rate of inflation for food has leveled off in 2024. But we're all still adjusting to the price increases that we saw in 2022 and 2023. And so we wanted to learn more about programs like SNAP and WIC and local food banks, how they work, how they're funded, and how they're coping with rising food prices and rising need in all of our communities. And so we are so grateful to Monica Kelly and Les Sinclair from the Blue Ridge Area Food Bank for sitting down with us to go through these programs. They are so knowledgeable, and I left this conversation feeling so grateful for public servants like the two of them. I really learned a lot in this interview, and I think you will too. Can you all start by introducing yourselves and telling me a little bit about your role at the Blue Ridge Area Food Bank? Yes, my name is Monica Kelly. I am the Public Benefits Outreach Manager with the Blue Ridge Area Food Bank. Um, I've been in this role since last year, February 15th. Um, That's when we sort of created this role. The food bank has a new strategic plan that has four pillars. And the fourth pillar of that strategic plan is us uh, supporting uh, our the people that we serve, supporting their household financial stability. Um, so one way that we're doing that is helping people connect to SNAP because if they could utilize the free food resources in their community and SNAP benefits, they could save their money and utilize that for utilities or rent. Um, so yes, that's what we're hoping to do. And that's the, the goal of my, my role is to help increase SNAP participation and access. And I'm Les Sinclair. I'm the communications and PR manager for the Blue Ridge Area Food Bank. I'm also involved in advocacy, and um, SNAP is uh, a little bit of advocacy in that it is included in something called the Farm Bill, and it's paid for through the Farm Bill. And so we want to make sure that there's a strong Farm Bill to um, make sure that SNAP continues. So the Blue Ridge Area Food Bank represents a huge part of the state of Virginia. Could y'all describe your service area a little bit? Uh, Yes. So if you look at the map of our service area, you'll see we go all the way up to Loudoun County. And then we also go as far down as Lynchburg, Bath County, then all the way over to Orange. So we serve a pretty big area and we have over 200 partners, I believe, over 200 pantry and program partners. Yeah, so those partners are food pantries, their shelters, our total area is about 12,000 square miles. It's about the size of Maryland and we straddle the Blue Ridge and we're about a third of Virginia. And we started in 1981 in rural Virginia over in Barona where our headquarters is. 
And it was an experiment because most food banking was done in urban areas, bigger cities, because it was easier to get the food out. And what we know now is that rural areas actually are more food insecure than the cities. And so that's why we have our branch model where we've got a branch in Winchester, a branch in Lynchburg, a branch in Charlottesville, and, and our headquarters in Verona. That allows us to spread out and make sure that we're able to cover this vast 12,000 square mile area. Great. So food assistance can be, I think, kind of confusing. Um, could you all kind of give us an overview of the different kinds of assistance that are available to people? Yes. There are several programs that are administered or policy is made and written by USDA. USDA administers these programs. So a couple of those programs, there's the Commodity Supplemental Food Program, CSFP. Those are food boxes that we pack right here in our Charlottesville branch. And then our pantry partners get those from whatever branch is closest to them. And any senior that they serve that meets the income um, they can get that senior box. There's also WIC, Women, Infants, and Children. I recently went to a training and learned a very new fact about the WIC program. Maybe, Mary, I'll, I'll get you to guess. What, what percentage of infants do you think are covered by WIC in the United States? 50. Oh, wow. Okay, very, very close. Almost half of the infants born in the United States are covered by WIC. Probably just because I've been um, reading y'all's blogs all day. <laughs> probably. I did my, just did my homework. <laughs> so if you're familiar with the WIC program, it's very, very, very specific. Some people back in the day might remember if you're on WIC, you would have these sheets of paper that would say, hey, you can get the eight ounce of the whole wheat oatmeal. And you give that piece of paper to the cashier and you, you're able to get that food. Now WIC benefits are distributed onto a debit card. Um, but it's still framed the same way. There's only specific items you can get. So it has to be a specific brand, specific type, like whole wheat. And there's also specific size requirements at times too. So as you can imagine, being a mom or someone that's caring for kids or a grandparent that has a toddler they're taking care of, being in a store and trying to figure out what exactly your WIC covers can be a little confusing. So there's WIC, and then there's SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly called Food Stamps. When I'm out in the community, when I say the term SNAP, nobody knows what, I, what I'm talking about. I remember one time a woman thought I was talking about Snapchat. <laughs> so a lot of times when you're talking to people about this, the best way to reference it is, oh, used to be called Food Stamps or EBT. Benefits are distributed on that EBT card or debit card once a month. So many SNAP recipients, what they associate with the benefit is that EBT card, because that's what they see and that's what they use when they're in the grocery store. Great. Are there limits on what you can buy with the SNAP cards at the grocery store? Yes. I'm actually glad you brought that up, because when I tell people, it's kind of surprising. So with SNAP benefits, which are EBT card, you can get food, only food, no hygiene, no alcohol, no tobacco products, anything like that. Food, no pet food, but food. But the food cannot be hot at the point of sale. So think about when you go into Food Lion or Walmart or Kroger, right? You go to the deli section, there's probably a, a hot food section with some rotisserie chicken probably. Well, when that chicken is under that heat lamp, you cannot buy that with SNAP benefits. You have to wait a couple of hours, maybe towards the end of the day for that grocery store until they move that same chicken into the cold storage area and then that is eligible for SNAP bucks. Do you know why that is? I, I get that question a lot and no, I, I really don't know why it is. There, There is a new restaurant meals program that is trying to be administered, um, that social services is administering. It's for specific people. Maybe they don't have full kitchens or maybe they are without a home. Mm -hmm. They can use their SNAP benefits at a restaurant 
if that restaurant accepts SNAP benefits. But this is brand, brand new program. There may be one or two restaurants in Virginia um, that's piloting the program now. So hopefully it'd be more widespread in a couple of years. This is why advocacy is so important, because anyone can reach out to their elected official and simply tell them how they feel about this. If they are in favor of this, okay, let them know. If they think that's silly, then okay, let them know. But this is where advocacy comes in, and you can reach out to your elected officials from local to federal and let them know how you feel. You've talked a little bit about eligibility that, you know, some of these programs are specifically for women and children or for elderly people. Mm -hmm. Um, What about, you know, income eligibility or family size, that kind of thing? Each program has different income requirements, different family size. They sometimes define household differently as well. So for an example, for WIC, WIC is very specific. If you take care of a child that is under five, so you don't have to be a woman, you could be a grandparent, you could be a single dad, you could be an uncle that has custody of their niece or their nephew. Um, If that child is under five, or maybe you're pregnant, maybe you unfortunately had a stillbirth, or maybe even a miscarriage at times, you would still be eligible for some sort of WIC service. WIC, um, their income requirement is sort of the same as Medicaid. So if you're eligible for Medicaid, you're eligible for WIC. And if you're interested in receiving WIC, the main way to get access to that program is by going to your local health department, whether that's going on their website or giving them a call because the health department really has a a main admin role within the WIC program because there are requirements to maintaining your WIC benefits, such as going to an in-person doctor's appointment every six months or requirements like that. So WIC is very, very specific, but it also has very, very good benefits. So with SNAP, income is very, very interesting. So one thing that's funny with SNAP is that it's administered federally, right? They set policy. They say, oh, you have to be here to be eligible, all of those things. But there are state options that states can opt into. Certain states opt into having telephonic signatures. So they're able to help people complete that application over the phone. Some states have waivers saying that, oh, you don't have to meet the work requirement or you aren't mandated to do a SNAP employment and training program. One thing that Virginia has opted into, stay with me, it's gonna get confusing for a little bit, is BBCE, Broad-Based Categorical Eligibility. I had to talk to the state several times to get just a clear understanding of what this is. But my, my last meeting with them, she broke it down very clearly. Broad-based categorical eligibility allows the state that uses it to use the 200% of the federal poverty guideline to determine if someone may be eligible for SNAP benefits. So for an example, a household of four people, the max is $5,000. So we start with looking at someone's income under that 200% of the federal poverty guideline. Any application assisters, any community-based program, that's what they're using to determine if someone should apply. Once that application gets to social services, they'll look at that person's situation in its entirety to determine if they're eligible. So for SNAP, there's a broad income eligibility like yes. threshold, but then if you mm-hmm. meet that, there's a more like holistic review process. Yes. So if you meet that threshold, you you may be eligible for SNAP, but then they may say, oh, you don't have this sort of expense or you don't have someone of this age within your household. Let's use the 130 percent of the federal poverty line to see if you're eligible. Um, so sometimes that's a little frustrating for people. They're like, oh, I meet the income under the 200%, but then they go through the process. They Maybe they complete the paper application that's over 15 pages long. 
in tiny font. Maybe they complete that whole application, mailed it to the office, and then they're being told, oh, your income doesn't meet the requirement. And then that guest is confused because I thought looking at the chart, I do. Mm -hmm. um, so that's some of the experiences that the people we help experience when it's time to do that application. We've been trained by the Virginia Department of Social Services on how to maximize people's SNAP benefits. And what I mean by maximize, I mean by getting as much benefits as you are entitled to. For an example, a lot of our older adults, they're not aware of some of the deductions that they most likely qualify for. So if you're over 60, right, maybe you have some out-of-pocket medical costs. Maybe you have Medicare. Maybe you get Social Security and that Medicare premium is taken out of your monthly Social Security check. Well, there's a SNAP medical deduction. If your medical expenses are more than $35 a month, out of pocket. You could list those expenses on your SNAP application and they will be deducted, making your net income much lower, which means your SNAP benefits are much higher. So Medicare premiums, prescriptions. If you have to drive from Greene County to Charlottesville once a week for a doctor's appointment, write down that mileage, how much you're spending on gas to get to that appointment. Are you dealing with some incontinence? Maybe you need some products. Put those costs down on that application as well, because we always want to make sure people are maximizing those benefits. And so then the amount that people get if they're approved, does that depend on the application? Yeah. Yes. So that that depends on what you put on that application and what they found when they checked with the Virginia Employment Commission mm -hmm. or Social Services or Social Security Administration. So a lot of the times when I'm helping people complete the application, I'm letting them know, hey, any information you put in this application, they're going to check with these other entities. But I'm always careful with that at the same time because a lot of people maybe who are undocumented, mm -hmm. they may be afraid to ask about the SNAP program, or they may be afraid to even apply because they think, oh, if I'm undocumented and I apply, I might get reported. But no, that is not the case. I made sure to double check this with so many representatives from social service offices in our area. If you're undocumented and you apply for SNAP, you'll just get denied. But if you're undocumented, maybe you have kids that are documented. You could get SNAP on behalf of your children. So I definitely don't want that to interfere with someone applying. But the amount of benefits you get all depends on household size, your household expenses, how much you spend on rent, utilities, or mortgage, and then your income. What is your income? What's that net income and where is it coming from? They compare those three factors to each other and that is what determines the benefit amounts. And then I think I just have one more question about SNAP, which is you mentioned work requirements. Um, yes. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, there are work requirements. During COVID, they were actually suspended. This is one of the waivers I was talking about. During COVID, Virginia um, got a waiver approved that kind of waived those work requirements. So now, the, I think the work requirements were reinstated maybe last year in June, I think. Now, in order to maintain SNAP benefits, um, if you're under 55, you have to work at least 20 hours a week. That's 80 hours a month. So for example, if you apply for SNAP, right, and you put, oh, I'm not employed. Okay. You will get approved for SNAP for up to three months. After that three months, if you don't have proof of you working at least 20 hours a week, they will deny you. Um, I get a lot of calls from people that are in very, very rural areas that have trouble finding employment. So a lot of the times I try to help them find a training program or an employee readiness program um, from a community-based organization near them, because oftentimes that kind of covers that work requirement. But if you have young children in your home, that work requirement may be waived as well. 
All right, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll talk more about food banks and non-governmental assistance. Bold Dominion is a member of the Virginia Audio Collective, a network of over 30 podcasts made right here in Virginia. Here's one we think you'll be interested in. Crosswinds is about two Black neighborhoods in coastal Virginia. They've complained for decades about the harmful coal dust from export terminals. It's just amazing because you, if you look at it, it's like it's mountains and mountains and mountains of coal. In Crosswinds, we'll listen to personal stories, expert testimony, and insider knowledge. Why are you killing my children? Is your profit really worth this? Bring 2024 everywhere. Coaldustkills.org. You mentioned the food bank doesn't have any of these requirements. Um, (laughs) Can y'all talk about how food banks fit into this larger landscape of food assistance programs? Yes. I remember when I first joined the team, I was wondering, why is the food bank doing this? Why are we doing SNAP outreach? How does that make sense? Our pantry partners come into contact with people in need regularly. And oftentimes they develop relationships, develop rapports with people in the community, and they are trusted entities. Some of those same people that visit these trusted entities, they've also visited maybe social services or another governmental agency, and they didn't have the best of experience. Because we know our agencies are operating under such dire circumstances, right? They're experiencing much more need, people calling, needing help, but those people working within those government sites aren't necessarily resourced as much as they need to be. Um, So as an organization that is in the community directly come into contact with people that are in need regularly, we are in a better position to sort of talk to them about something so vulnerable, something that does have such a big stigma on it. Les, did you want to add anything about the food bank and where how we are within this food assistance network? I will tell you this, that the food insecurity in the Blue Ridge is vast. One in 10 people in the Blue Ridge area are food insecure, one in 11 children. And if you would think about how many people we feed, multiply that by nine, and that's how many people SNAP feeds. So SNAP is this huge umbrella that really is a food security catch. And then we help underneath that. And so it is vital for us to be able to tell people that, hey, SNAP might be a better fit for you. And you can still use the food bank as well. Yeah, because it's all supplemental resources. I make sure to tell everybody this, especially volunteers. We train food pantry or the food bank supplemental. SNAP supplemental, but together they can provide you your whole meal so that you can utilize your money for like bills and and rent and things like that. We're hearing a lot in the news these days about inflation and specifically the price of food going up. How would y'all describe the level of need that you're seeing these days? Skyrocketing. Uh, it's it's really tremendous. Um, last fiscal year, we saw about 127,500 people, that is guest visits on average, every single month. That's a line of people, if you lined them shoulder to shoulder, that would stretch about 30 miles. In the last six months of last year, last fiscal year, it was 153,000 guest visits on average per month with a high in October of 173,000. So the demand is increasing for these sorts of things. And it's got a lot to do with an income gap, a wage gap, we believe, and the cost of everyday items going up, your housing, your gasoline, your childcare, and your food. What sorts of things are y'all able to do to try and meet that rapidly growing demand? We're buying more food. That's yes. that's the real answer. Before the pandemic, we spent about $1.8 million in 2019 on food. And this year we'll spend over $5 million on food. And that food also costs us more just as it does regular folks. We're still able to stretch a dollar. So $10 will help provide 30 meals, but the cost is definitely a challenge. 
So you mentioned the Farm Bill and USDA. Uh, we've also talked about you know some state differences between programs. What do people need to know about the policy around these programs and the levels of government that are involved? Mm-hmm. Les, Les is the, our head of our advocacy. Well, well what, what do people need to know, Les? <laughs> well, I think the thing that folks need to know is that something like the Farm Bill, which is the umbrella for SNAP and WIC and the CSFP program, that's the Senior Food Box program, uh, as well as stuff like TANF, it really helps farmers and people who need food as well. And when it comes to the food bank itself, we get a lot of our food through the USDA, through something called TFAP, and that's the Emergency Food Assistance Program. I think I got it right. And uh, if they provide us enough food, we don't have to buy more food, and it allows us to provide this free food to our partner pantries. Otherwise, we're spending money on food, and then our partner pantries are spending money on food. Often, they don't have that to spend, and that's a challenge for then the guest. So it all really does work in tandem and together, and the farm bill and the policies that control these things are really important. So when the government is trying to regulate this, and to some extent, they they should, in that there are even locally here, I just uh, heard a recent news story about skimming going on with snap cards a lot here in the city of Charlottesville. And that is a challenge, that fraud. But the government can also make that fraud a little better by updating their technology. These cards, these EBT cards that they have do not have chips in them. uh, And so they're easily skimmed and the pin number is easily uh, grabbed. So the fraud is a big deal. It's also something that the government can do something about. Why is food assistance important? Food assistance is important because we believe here at the Blue Ridge Area Food Bank that everyone should have enough to eat. Everybody's life starts with that basic staple of, you know, food, water, shelter and food being the first on the list. So we know that health is really, really important. It is vital, not just for young children and school age children so that they can grow and they can maximize their potential, but so that they don't have ailments like asthma and uh, attention deficit disorder and they behave better in school. And then as you progress in life, the better your food, the better your life will be and the less you will cost the government. And so this food is a vital part of that health. All right. If y'all could wave a magic wand and change one Virginia policy related to food access, what would it be? The income requirement. I think I would raise the income requirement just because all the people I come into contact with that their income is a little bit above, but they're still in need. The SNAP application, they ask you, oh, how much do you pay for utilities? And then, oh, your home, rent, mortgage. But they don't ask about the other things you have to pay for. Maybe you have a a car note that is excessive, but it was the only car you you would have been approved for. Maybe there's other things you pay for that you couldn't necessarily report on the SNAP application. There are so many factors that come in and contribute to a person's income and whether they have enough to support themselves and their household. I'm just really seeing that income requirement keep a lot of people hungry, especially our older adults. I just spoke with a woman whose income was $2,500, but her rent was high, but it still didn't make her eligible for SNAP benefits. So the only thing I can do is help her connect to a food pantry. Yeah, I think for me, it would be using food as a political weapon. I think that happens all too often. And we know from the research from Feeding America that um, over 80 percent of Republicans and 90 some percent of Democrats believe that um, people should have enough to eat. And they believe in programs like SNAP and TFAP when they find out about them. And I think that if we just had less politics and more people caring, it would be better. I second that less. Is there anything else you all want to talk about that I didn't ask about? I do want to put out there a new program that is starting this summer. Um, It's called Virginia Sunbucks. This is basically summer EBT. So during the pandemic, 
people were given um, SNAP benefits on their car, extra SNAP benefits during their summer months for their children. Well, now this program is going to be here to stay. So starting this summer, actually starting this August, people will receive funds on their EBT cards for their kids. So it's $40 per child. Um, it's around $120 per kid for the summer. Um, and if you would like to see if you may be eligible for that, if you already have SNAP benefits, you're most likely eligible for that. But you can always go to virginiasunbucks.com to see if you're eligible for that extra money, that $120. It is important to note, too, that you've got a limited time to apply for that. I think it's before the end of July. Yes. And those benefits then will uh, start being paid in August. We truly believe that everyone should have enough to eat. And we've got a really good tool on our website that will help people find that. We call it our food finder tool. And so if you go to our website at brafb.org, that's the acronym for Blue Ridge Area Food Bank.org, click on find food and you can put in your address and uh, into the map and it'll find a food pantry near you and give you not only the map, but the contact information so that you can call ahead and make sure that you have what you need to go there and their open hours. And it's a really useful tool. And I want to remind folks that you will not be taking away from anyone. If you seek out food, there is plenty of food and you can, you are welcome to it. And so use that food finder tool and locate a pantry and go there and get yourself some food if you need it. Monica Kelly is the Public Benefits Outreach Manager, and Les Sinclair is the Communications and PR Manager for the Blue Ridge Area Food Bank. We are so grateful for their time and expertise. You can connect to a food bank near you with a food finder tool. We'll link that below. We'll also link to the Virginia Sunbucks program and the blog of the Blue Ridge Area Food Bank, which has so much great information in it. A huge thank you to our assistant producer, Sarah Bastianelli, for research, scheduling, and editing of this episode. I'm Mary Garner McGee, and you can find more Bold Dominion episodes at bolddominion.org and online at the Virginia Audio Collective. We'll be back in your feed in two weeks. <laughs>